Drolette and welcome to Aspen Air Television. I'm here with Memphis Lindsay today. I want to thank Brunelleschi's restaurant in beautiful downtown Aspen where we are filming today. Memphis Lindsay, you have been performing since 1992. What is it like to be a musician for that long? Uh, it feels great to have the staying power that people are still interested in what you do and still have the ability to perform. Now you're originally from Memphis, Tennessee and that's where you began the band, correct? No, it was started here. Um, I moved out here and uh, fell in with a group of snowboarders who were all into uh, punk rock music and I in turn got into it with them as long as snowboarding and I bought my first guitar from Sandy's right here around the corner, Great Divide Music Shop, in 1990 and I formed my first band, Discolored Perception, in 1992. Our first gig was at the Hard Rock Cafe uh, right over here a couple blocks down on Main Street, uh, Thanksgiving benefit. And what is it like to be a punk rock musician in the Roaring Fork Valley? It's amazing. <laughs> People love it. Well, is it more challenging than other genres? I mean, you don't really find a lot of people who appreciate punk rock around this valley. It's more bluegrass and, I would say, acoustic. Or... We've gone in peaks and valleys, you know. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, our shows were were packed and there was a lot of interest, you know, maybe it was fueled by the early wave of snowboarders. The early wave of snowboarding really and uh, punk rock seemed to go together, you know, it wasn't uh, a very uh, accepted thing uh, and the music fueled it as well, you know, it's a high energy sport that requires that type of music. Just like skateboarding, um, you know, underground hardcore in the early 80s, it traveled along those routes just because you know, that form of music fueled the sport. The other types of music just, you couldn't really perform your sport at the level that uh, you, you could with a high energy style of music. You know, rock and roll never die, it comes and goes. You know, it, uh, people love it and then people move on and then people come back to it. And your music is rebellious by nature. Can you talk more about that? Definitely, well the music is rebellious because we've always maintained our independence. You know, I've never signed to any label, I've never, uh, you know, it's always, uh, I've always had a job to maintain the independence of it, you know, to, for the integrity level of the music. You know, I've never had any record company telling me what I could or couldn't do when I go into a studio, which is uh, very liberating. It's also a very difficult path to take because, you know, the economic rewards may not be there and you have to put in a lot of your own money to, uh, to maintain, you know, what you love to do. But that's okay for me, you know, I, I've seen some you know, older movies back in the day, you know, it was always another state of mind was a very influential movie on me where you see like Henry Rollins and uh, Ian MacKay, they're in there scooping ice cream for haagen saying, you know, we're doing our music our way. We don't have to, uh, you know, change the way we want to play our music or record our music just because somebody's telling us this will be more commercially viable and you can, you know, maintain this dream of being on the road and loved by millions. Another important aspect of your music is the importance of the lyrics. You're kind of the Bob Dylan of punk rock, would that be fair to say? Well, that's a pretty I mean, heavy, heavy statement. But you're, I mean, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that you write music that's important. And yeah. Can I, you talk more about that? Yeah, a lot of, you know, the, the formulas these days are to find a catchy hook and a catchy melody, throw in a couple of woo-hoos in there, maybe even a whistle and you're off and running for mainstream acceptance, you know. Um, maybe that's what I've always uh, turned away from. I wanted to write something that was, uh, could maybe inspire people, inspire change, or just maybe an observation of social commentary of what's going on in the world instead of maybe just a candy-coated sense of uh, everything is okay and, and um, I just want to write songs about chasing girls or... I mean, that's okay too. I mean, some people do that and they do that very well. But for me, life was always a little more serious, and maybe I've captured that in, uh, in writing about it. You know, I, the way I grew up, you know, with, with my father uh, was a, a restless uh, football coach, so we moved a lot. So always moving around the country at an early age and having to, like, always be the new kid. And, and when they finally did settle in Memphis, you know, it was a very refreshing change for me. So it was... It allowed me to adapt into something that was like, oh, okay, this is a sense of stability. But just, uh, you know, from being a young kid traveling, I got to see a lot of the United States as a young kid in, in different areas of the country and, and, uh, and write about those travels and, and things. You know, it'd probably be more of a, 
a Woody Guthrie approach. That's pretty much where Dylan got most of his take. Uh, Woody Guthrie and probably ran with Jack Elliott, if anything. And how would you describe your sound? You know, we, we mix a lot of, uh, you know, you, we mix a lot of different genres together. You know, you, you could call it, uh, you know, just good old fashioned rock and roll, really, because, I mean, rock and roll originally, when it started, was, a, was an unaccepted form of music that they thought was going to go away. You know, they, and, and those musicians drew from like, you know, old country, gospel, blues, you know, and, and uh, western swing is what they used to call it. And they mixed it into all these different forms, you know, and, and it became this totally new thing. And then we mixed forms of those old, old, old types of music as well as maybe, uh, you know, a lot of the, the scenes that were coming out of... Uh, out of New York City with the CBGB scene, a lot of those bands, you know, I really loved what they were doing, you know, and that was a, all those bands, none of them sounded like, you know, you had different bands like the Ramones, you had uh, the Dead Boys, you had the Heartbreakers, all these different bands that had different sounds, and, and that was conveyed across the pond to, to England and what was going on with the early punk movie with the Sex Pistols. And, you know, some people would point out that maybe the Sex Pistols album that they put out was just a rockabilly record. You know, just with heavy distortion and more intense political commentary. So a lot of the sound comes from, from old school rockabilly, old country, blues, gospel, um, and then mixed with, you know, heavy doses of energy, mm -hmm. you know. And going back to your background, as you were saying that you, um, your music has a more serious tone because of the things that have happened in your life, can you talk more about these more serious tone things that have happened that have well, created your music well you know the way i grew up was uh you know in all different areas of the country and i was born in shreveport louisiana and my father was a high school uh, football coach and then as he started uh getting promoted in that field which is one that requires a lot of moving a lot of a lot of traveling you know we moved all around the country you know and um, so i've got to see different uh areas of the country and you know, always being the new kid, you have to always go into a new school, and um, constantly, uh, you know, make new friends, uh, leave new friends, and you're always rambling, just rolling down the road. So I've got to see different areas of the country. You know, we moved from uh, from uh, Louisiana to Mississippi to Oklahoma to Washington to California to Colorado to Iowa to Western New York you know, to Kansas and then to Memphis. So this was like a wide sweeping move of all different cultures that, you know, weren't connected as they were today. You know, every part of the country then was a different part of the country. You didn't have the internet to bring all aspects of even what uh, music was being played on the radio. Every station in the country back then would play something different. You know, the mainstream was the mainstream, but the, you know, a lot of college radio I was exposed to. So, you know, it just took a more serious tone to tell the young kid, you know, we're moving again and we're throwing you into a new school and then, you know, fend for yourself and then uh, here we go, we're moving again and to constantly be the new kid. You know, after a while, you know, nobody likes the new kid, especially if he talks funny with a southern accent and you're living in California. You know, everybody wants to fight the new kid. Maybe the new kid is attracting some girls that like him, which the local kids don't like so it's you know after a while you have to fight for uh, fight for everything you know so the, the new kid formula was to get in a fight and say okay don't mess with the new kid he's one of us <laughs> so constantly trying to find you know some form of acceptance when you're a kid is, is, is more what you're trying to achieve you know you're not trying to like when you're a kid you just want to be accepted you don't want to be different and how does that come through through your music well, I think you can hear it in the uh, some, in some forms of maybe the the, uh, the aggressiveness of the music. You know, it's a 
you know, you, you're going to always reflect what you've gone through as a child in your music. You know, it's, it's always going to be there, whether it's in the conscious or the subconscious. You know, people would say, oh, it's loud and it's fast. He's angry, you know. Maybe there's some anger there, too, but, you know, when does that anger turn into just an energetic form of music? You're trying to express in a way that uh, maybe doesn't come across with, a, you know, an acoustic guitar. Change the scenario, the grass is green and the sky is blue. Chastise for the naked viewers, showing too much that is true. Documented and fed to you, it's not your life, so pass on through. And this is why the hatred grew, the conscious mind came to rule. But don't respond for what you choose, that the inside is never formed. It's a habit of rush, and that's why we lose. Percussion lies behind the door in the past. What is a confession? Walk with faith, we're passing through. Be wise and only let the best in. Now, you recently got back from Seattle. You were recording with the godfather of grunge, um, Jack and Dino, who recorded Nirvana's first record with them. Um, tell me how that experience went. It was, it was amazing, you know, um, I had been talking to him, you know, he's got a big website and uh, he has an FAQ page, you know, it kind of directs the Nirvana questions to that page. But there were a couple other records that made me want to work with him. Um, he did some great records with, uh, with Mud, Mud Honey, did Super Fuzz Big Muff, which was a great record. Um, but the two records that I loved the most that he had done were uh, Kicked in the Teeth by Zeke and uh, the Black Halos record, Violent Years. And these are records that I was like, this is amazing. I mean, I, I love Nirvana. I, I, I saw them in Denver when they played on the Neuro Tour. But these records were more uh, toward what I was doing, more rock and roll records. And I felt like he really got it with the fact of not only could he record loud guitars, which was important to my sound, but he also recorded loud drums, which was what makes loud guitars loud. And I think a lot of producers neglect the fact of, of taking the drum side of recording is equally important as a guitar sound. So I I'd, I'd contacted him and, and you know he had this huge uh, thing of let me send me your music, you know, if, if I like it then maybe we can work together because I'm going to be recording it and I'm going to listen to it over and over and over again. There's nothing more painful than listening to somebody I don't like's music over and over and over again. So we traded some emails and he liked what I was doing. And, um, and I'd set it up for a year later, so a year, in the, a year of planning in the making uh, just concluded a couple weeks ago. And uh, so we went up there as a band, and, um, and he was great. He was, ve he was very humble, and he's very into what he's doing. And you can feel his passion. Uh, he, he recorded us very quickly, and he doesn't waste any time. And he... And he he walks around and paces around the control booth like a mad professor and trying to find the sounds and trying to find the ways to bring out the performance of each member. And so when we were doing uh, our overdubs, you know, we recorded it all live and then we did some overdubbing on some solos and some, and some patchwork and each, each band member had a chance to work with him one on one. And um, that was the most fulfilling aspect, I think, for a lot of band members, was to work with this guy who you, you knew had done a lot of records. I mean, he's almost made 500 records, so you knew he knew what he was doing. So working with somebody like that, that you not only respect, but you, you get an, a sense very quickly that, wait a minute, this guy knows exactly what he's doing. He's, he's a master in his own regard. So that was very refreshing to work with somebody like that. What will the future hold? Well, you know, the future holds um, is mixing the record. I have to go back and mix the record, which is going to happen at the end, end of September. And, you know, it all holds on putting that record out. You know, it's a, it's a very, very big record. It's going to be probably 14 or 15 songs. So we'll see how well that's received. And um, it's just going to involve more touring and more shows and more, more, more. <laughs> If you could talk to um, yourself when you first begin, what would you say? You know, stay the course. Um, be patient with the process. Be more willing to uh, compromise with your bandmates. You know, 
a lot of early decisions I made, maybe there wasn't a whole lot of compromise, which may have led to some unique music uh, in that regard. But, and I'd just say stay the course, you know, because the vision I had then is still the same I have now. And what is that vision? It's just to keep making the kind of music you want to make and, and, and stay the course with that, you know, because I've always been influenced by like some, some bands that I really love and I still feel that same when I listen to the records now. It's, it hasn't really waned. It seems like the fight I had then is the same I have now, you know, it's just a give it to them, you know, and an unbridled raw form of music, almost like a Where primitive tribal. From? It comes from being told no, I guess. <laughs> the rebellious nature that never seems to uh, calm down, you know? It just seems like people like so find themselves settling into a form of mediocrity that they just never wanted to be at. And so I always wanted to work hard and, and to maintain a high sense of, you know, we're never gonna stop and nobody's ever gonna tell us what to do. And, we're just gonna keep sticking it to the man because that's what it's really all about, you know, in rock and roll, making your own personal statement, you know. And, and you know, it's fueled as well as by the, you know, the energy of snowboarding, you know. The, the two for me go hand in hand because I'm still doing the same things I was doing in 1990. I still love punk rock and I still love to snowboard. A lot of my friends, I, they're no longer, you know, doing either of those. And um, that's always been what's driving me the most, you know, is, Snowboarding for me is such a pure form of expression, you know, to get out all the uh, your anger of, you know, whatever it is you do with your day job or say you get in a fight with your girlfriend or you get in a fight with somebody. It's always a way of expressing it and taking out, you know, your you against the world feelings. And what kind of sound can we expect from this new album? It's, it's going to be raw, it's going to be abrasive, it's going to be loud, and it's going to be relentless. It's going to be in your face. It's going to be great. Did you learn anything from Jack and Dino? Oh, man. He is amazing. You know, here's a guy that has made a ton of records, and he, could, he has maintained such a sense of humility and humbleness that uh, I learned that, you know, no matter what you're doing and how well it's received, it's still very important to remain that sense of approachability. I want to thank our guest today, Memphis Lindsay. Memphis Lindsay, how do fans get a hold of you? Uh, we have a website on Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com backslash memphislindsay.rocks, as well as we have several videos on YouTube. I'm Elizabeth Drolette, and this is Aspen Air Television. Well, Man wants it Don't let it go